Our next presentation will be given by Stin Brewers. He is a PhD, he has a PhD in physics and is doing a PhD at uh, Ghent University in philosophy and moral science. His current work is at the Belgian environmental organization Ecolife. Stin is an active member of the organization Biteback and participated in Sea Shepherd's Antarctica whale defense campaign. He is also the author of books about environmental ethics and animal rights. In his presentation today, he will use logic to grasp the moral problem of consuming animal pro products and demonstrate that veganism is the only consistent choice. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so in the previous two um, conferences, I gave several presentations on different aspects of my PhD research. So I'm now finishing a PhD research in moral philosophy at Ghent University. Um, and it will be about the ethical consistency of animal equality. And my intention is to go really um, deep thinking all the problems um, through, um, moving beyond Tom Reagan and Peter Singer. I'm very ambitious. <laughs> um, so, and as a result, today I can pre present you a summary of um, my research. And I will present it in a metaphor, the model hand, because I, um, um, I um, systematically capture all of my whole ethical system in five principles, yeah? So five fingers, they represent five principles and together um, they can grab, grasp all moral problems, not only about animal issues, but overpopulation, abortion, you name a problem. And I can say, well, um, the principles of my moral hands say this and that. So it's allowed or not allowed. Um, but today I will mostly focus on animal rights. Uh, and to start with, well, um, let's show the first principle. This is the thumb. It's a, uh, yeah, the slides are really boring and long, but I will uh, present it for you. Now, the, the thumb principle, that's a basic starting point. What I actually do is um, I collect all my moral intuitions, so my spontaneous gut feelings, automatic reactions um, about whether something is allowed or not. Um, also, a lot of meat eaters have those same moral intuitions. Um, I can demonstrate, but yeah, that takes too long time. So let's put all our moral intuitions, including those of the meat eaters, on the table. Yeah. Um, so these are spontaneous judgments, and we have difficulty to give a further justification for them. We simply say, like, uh, this is wrong, and I don't know why it's wrong, but it's wrong. Harming someone is wrong, and that's it. So these are the starting points. The moral intuitions are the starting points. And then I translate those moral intuitions into ethical principles. And then I check for consistency. So the first part of my thesis, uh, ethical consistency of animal equality. Now this ethical consistency, that's a, actually it's a very complicated thing. And I have no time to um, really explain what it means. But the thumb principle is related to it. Um, now, um, this ethical consistency, what I can derive, for example, is that if a meat eater wants to construct an ethical system, then we can easily show that this ethical system will be inconsistent. So that's one thing, but then if uh, an animal rights activist wants to construct an ethical system, is this uh, system, can it be made consistent? And my answer now will be yes. Um, you can do it. And um, I will not go into detail what I mean with consistency. It will hopefully be a bit, become a bit clear. Um, so now let's move to the um, first principle, the rule of thumb. So it's called the thumb. Um, and that is related to what I call rule universalism. I will read it for you. Um, it's, it has two versions. The first version says, you must follow the rules 
that everyone, everyone who is capable, who is rational, who is well informed, uh, whoever, that everyone must follow in all morally similar situations. It looks easy, it looks trivial. Um, so I refer to everyone and I refer to all morally similar situations. So, so that means it's kind of universal thing. Yeah? The other uh, version is in the may form, so in the permission form. You may follow only those rules that everyone may follow in all morally similar, similar situations. Um, so what can we say with this rule? Um, first, it, we can derive something like giving the good example. You must do what everyone must do. So if no one is a vegan, then this rule would say you should become vegan because that is something that everyone must do. So even if you have to swim against the stream um, in society, if that's what everyone should do, well, then you should do it. So giving the good example. That's what we all know. Huh? We should give the good example, try to be consistent ourselves and so on. Um, so if people uh, say like, are these uh, leather shoes and so on, um, we know that this meat eater, he values consistency, that's nice, okay, like, yeah, I, I see that consistency is important for you. And that's why I would say, like, yeah, we should strive to wear vegan shoes then, okay. So let's do what everyone should do then. Um, what else can we say? Well, there is a second part, um, all morally similar situations. And if you read it, then you, of course, no, do not know yet what this means. What are the morally similar situations? Um, so the other fingers that I will present, um, they will explain a little bit more what morally similar means. But one of the things that we can derive is um, morally similar situations also implies um, morally equal individuals. So if you are not allowed to harm a white person, then you're not allowed to harm a black person because these are morally similar individuals and it's a morally similar situation. So what we derive in this rule, um, it's a very abstract or formal rule that uh, goes against uh, discrimination. Yeah? It values impartiality. So anti-discrimination and impartiality are included in this rule of thumb. Um, so now if we only have this very abstract rule of thumb, it's, we cannot do much with it. We cannot grab a model problem because yeah, the thumb, that's an opposable thumb. We have to put the thumb against the other fingers in order to really grab something. With only one finger, you cannot do that much. So is this clear that um, the rule of thumb, it's a very abstract rule, it said something about universalism, and this universalism, that is really the key of consistency. Um, so the claim of all morally similar situations and things that everyone should do or that everyone is allowed to do, that is the key to consistency. So for example, if I want to rape a woman, then I should uh, find a rule that allows uh, everyone to rape women. Can I find such a rule? No, okay, then I am not allowed to rape a woman, okay? So this is kind of, uh, it, it sets the stage for consistency. Another slide with a big uh, text is the uh, index finger, the forefinger. Um, and this forefinger, it's about uh, the value of well-being and uh, how to distribute well-being amongst individuals. And so that is related to justice. Now, um, these two fingers, the thumb and the, and the forefinger, uh, together they are the most important fingers. With them we do the most things. So these two principles, the thumb and the, the forefinger, um, they can already tackle, let's say, 90% of all ethical issues that we deal with. Are gays allowed to marry? You can derive it from the thumb and the um, forefinger. Yeah. Um, so what does this rule say? I will first uh, read uh, the rule and then I will explain how it is derived. The rule says that we should increase the well-being and well-being considered over a complete life of an individual of all sentient beings uh, alive 
in the present and in the future, also future generations are taken into account. And uh, we should thereby improve the positions of the worst of individuals. So the worst sufferers, the beings who have the worst lives, um, we should give a strong priority towards them. Yeah. Um, now what I mean with a lifetime well-being, um, that is actually, uh, if you look at the life of a being, like let's say we have a dog here, um, how would it be for me if I were really this dog living the complete life of this dog? How strongly would I like to live the life of this dog? Um, so I can give a value to living the complete life of this dog. If it's negative, then it means that I would prefer not to be even born. If it's really um, like a lot of pigs in the factory farms, that's most likely negative. You will rather prefer not to be born than to be born as a pig living six months in the factory farms. But if it's positive, then you can say, okay, um, I would prefer to live such a life instead of not being born. Um, so we ascribe a value to a whole life of an individual. Um, and now it is composed of uh, what matters, all the positive feelings. Um, and not only positive feelings, but all the feelings that are the result of satisfaction of preferences. Um, so it's everything um, that is wanted by an individual and excluding everything that's not wanted. Um, so it's a mixture of looking at the feelings of the individual, but also looking at the preferences. Um, for people who are familiar with um, utilitarian ethics, it's a really complicated issue here. I will not explain more about it. Um, there are some crazy thought experiments about a pleasure machine. Should you plug on a pleasure machine which gives you all good feelings? Um, and most people are reluctant, like stepping into the matrix, and you can do whatever you want in the matrix. Um, and, well, this is here. Um, not only feelings are important, but also the preference of the individual. If you prefer authenticity, if you prefer to stay in the real world, well, that is a preference that we should respect, and this preference means that you're not that willing to plug into the matrix. Um, now, there are, the interesting thing is there are two ways to derive this principle. One is, um, if you're familiar about uh, the political justice uh, theory of John Rawls, he has an interesting thought experiment. It's called Veil of Ignorance. And uh, some philosophers, some animal ethicists, they extend this thought experiment to all individuals, not only to persons or moral agents or humans. And this thought experiment goes as follows, in the broad sense as I intended. Um, imagine you are behind a veil of ignorance, and I'll tell you soon, you will enter the real world, and you will live the life of a person. You can be a gay person, you can be a female, you can be a dog, you can live in the year 3000, you can live now, you can be mentally disabled, um, but also you can be, for example, this computer. You can be whatever, you can be this glass of water, whatever. Um, now, um, behind this veil of ignorance, you're sitting there now, and you are allowed to choose the rules um, of the, the rule of thumb I told you about. So you are now allowed to derive the rules that our moral agents should follow. You can decide it now behind the veil of ignorance. What should you do? Well, um, for example, the rule of can I um, me now destroy um, this computer? Well, it's not my computer, but suppose it's my computer. <laughs> um, imagine that you are this computer and I destroy this computer. How would it be for you? Well, we know that the computer is not sentient. It would be nothing for you. I will not influence your well-being because your well-being is zero. There's nothing like to be a um, computer. You have no preferences. You can, uh, there is not something that you want, you do not want to um, be destroyed because you don't have any wants, you don't have any likes, you know. And that automatically implies here that sentience becomes important. Yeah, so it gives us a different moral status between sentient beings and non-sentient beings like computers. If you are a sentient being like a pig, um, 
can I destroy the pig? Well, um, you have preferences, you have feelings, um, you will be scared, you will feel like you don't want uh, what I was going to do with it. So that means it's kind of trespassing. Yeah. Um, now, sitting behind this veil of ignorance, you know you can be ev everything. You don't care about the non-sentient things, so forget about the computer. So you're only concerned about becoming a sentient being. Now, you don't know who or what you will be. You can be a human who likes to eat meat, but you can also be a pig in perhaps a pig farm. And now it's uh, balancing. You know, it's a game of chance. If you are the human who can eat pigs, well, your um, lifetime well-being will be very high. If you are, on the other hand, the pig in the factory farm, your lifetime well-being will be very low. Um, so let's say you have a half chance, um, probably probability one half to become the pig and probability one half to become the human. That's really scary. You know, you are very concerned to become the worst of individual, and this is the pig. Yeah. Um, so what actually happens, most people behind the veil of ignorance, they have a kind of risk aversion. They are too scared to be the worst of individual, one of the worst of um, individuals. And that is why, behind the veil of ignorance, most of us will come to the conclusion that the well-being of the worst of individuals should get a priority. We should first increase those well-beings um, instead of uh, yeah, giving well-being to already rich people. Um, that is one way to derive this rule. Yeah? It's derived by a veil of ignorance. And interesting about this veil of ignorance, if you do not know who or what you will be, you are guarantee guaranteed to be impartial. Yeah? Um, if you are a racist and you're sitting behind the veil of ignorance and you realize that you can be a black person, you stop being racist because you realize you can be a black person who is treated as a slave and you do not want that, okay? So it's a guarantee to be impartial. That's very nice. Um, but there is another more intuitive approach to this principle and that is based on empathy. There are different kinds of empathy. One em kind of empathy is related to persons that we know very well. We have a, a strong connection with friends and so on. But there's also a, a different kind of a more impartial empathy. What we li like, look on, at the TV and you see different individuals. Let's say you see uh, 10 persons and they all suffer to some, some degree. Yeah? Then most people have the strongest empathy towards the individual who is the worst, of, the worst sufferer. Yeah. And um, so this worst of position, this position should get the priority. We should first increase this well-being. But um, most of us also have a need for efficiency. And what do I mean with that? Well, consider a rich person here and a poor child in Africa. And let's say the only way to increase the well-being of this poor child is by um, using all the resources of the rich person and flow them towards the child. So the rich person has a high well-being and the poor child has a low well-being. And we can increase the well-being of the poor child by drastically decreasing the well-being of the rich person. Yeah? And I mean drastically driving a rich person into extreme poverty for a negligible increase of well-being of the worst off. Most of us would say like, you know, I value well-being of the worst off, but I also value efficiency. This is too much loss of well-being. So a drop of a huge amount of well-being of this rich person for only a negligible amount, that's um, not efficient. So um, in ethics, this uh, result is called prioritarianism. You give a high, but not a maximum priority to the worst of individuals. Now, looking at animal rights uh, philosophy, um, you have two camps. On one hand, you have Peter Singer, who does not give any priority to the worst of. For, um, for Peter Singer, basically only well-being matters for accounts equally for everyone, and you do not give a preference for the worst of. This was criticized by, for example, Tom Reagan and others. Um, it's, 
it violates um, a lot of uh, an intuition that a lot of people of us have. Yeah. Um, if you want to know more about it, you can find um, crazy dilemmas where Peter Singer would say, you're allowed to do that, and our intuition would say, like, oh, no, come on, you're not replacing this person by another person, that's not allowed. So replacing persons and so on, that's um, tricky. Um, and so what, um, as a reaction, you had, for example, Richard Ryder, um, who has this uh, philosophy of painism, and Richard Ryder is on the other extreme. He gives a absolute, a maximum priority to the worst of. So you look at um, animal experiments, and so you see there are patients in the hospital. They have low well-being. You see animals and so on. You look for the worst well-being. OK, that's this chimpanzee here, worst well-being. That uh, priority, all priority should go to increasing this well-being. Um, and so that's the other extreme. And as a most people think like, you know, I value this, uh, the giving priority to the worst of, but I also value efficiency. It's too much loss of well-being. The same with um, in Tom Reagan. He has this uh, mini right and worst of principles. And there is also, that was also criticized, like you're sitting in a lifeboat and um, there are five people, five humans, they, and a dog, okay, you can throw the dog overboard. But suppose there are millions of dogs on board and you can only save the five, the, to the boat, huh, by throwing a million dogs overboard. Most of us would say like, okay, one dog, that's it. But a million dogs, sacrificing a million dogs, um, that's to, uh, way too much loss of well-being. Um, so I myself and a lot of other um, philosophers are kind of in between, giving a priority to the worst of, but not a maximum priority. OK, that's, is that clear? If there are now questions on this, um, if not, then I go on. Um, so well-being, um, that's the forefinger. Now there are some other. Um, moral um, dilemmas, and we are faced with other moral intuitions. Uh, the most extreme, perhaps, is this one. Um, in the hospital, there are five patients. They need new organs. Unfortunately, no organs are available. But at randomly, we pick a person here from the audience um, who has the correct fit. And with the organs, the spleen, the liver, and the heart, we can save five persons in hospital. Yeah. One person sacrificed, five alive. Now, if you are really impartial and if you value efficiency and whatever, um, with the forefinger, you would easily derive that it's allowed to sacrifice a person in order to save five people. Because yeah, you can more likely be one of the five than being the one sacrificed. So think rationally. Um, but still, most people say, like, no, it's never allowed to sacrifice. Uh, one individual in order to benefit others. And um, there are thousands of other this kind of dilemmas, like terror bombing is not allowed, um, some kinds of torture to get information is not allowed, using someone as a human shield is not allowed, cannibalism and slavery and rape are not allowed, even if they increase well-being, it's still not allowed. Um, and so that means we need another finger, it's called the middle finger, which refers to the mere means principle and to a basic right to bodily autonomy. Um, this principle is related to most part of Tom Reagan's philosophy and um, basically 100% um, or so of Gary Francione's philosophy. Gary Francione speaks about basic right not to be used as property. You can you say it as a basic right not to be used as merely a means or a basic right to bodily autonomy. For me, these are kind of uh, overlapping or um, synonyms. So I will read it for you. We should never use the body of a sentient being as merely a means to someone else's ends, because that will violate the right to bodily autonomy. And if you look at the mere means principle, these are two words, mere and means. So that means that there are two conditions if, two uh, if the two conditions are met, then someone is used as merely a means. Uh, 
If I go to a baker, of course, uh, you can say you use the baker um, as a means. Um, he has to make bread for me. Huh? But it's not really using him as merely a means. So you need two conditions. The first one is if in order to reach an end, for example, uh, saving someone, uh, saving the five people in hospital, you uh, force a sentient being to do or undergo something that the being does not want, then you're already in orange zone. Um, if the second condition is met, then you're in red. You know, you should not do it. Uh, the second condition means if that body of that sentient being is necessary as a means for that end, then um, the treatment uh, the, um, is not allowed. So in this hospital dilemma, uh, of course, the body of I pick you from the audience. Your body is necessary. Without your body, I cannot use your organs to save the five. So your body is necessary. With rape, the body is necessary. With slavery, the body is necessary. Using someone as a human shield, of course, the body is necessary. The presence of the body is necessary in order for your plan to work. And um, so that's one condition. Um, and the second condition means that if you do not want to be sacrificed and your body is necessary, then it means I violate your bodily autonomy. I use you as merely a means and that should not be done. So you can see the middle finger is a little bit longer than the forefinger, which means that this uh, basic right principle is stronger than simply well-being. Uh, for example, the basic right not to be used as merely a means is at least five times as strong as the right to live the right to have a pleasurable life, let's say. Huh? So your right um, not to be used is five times stronger than the lives of those five patients in the hospital. They die because I cannot use you, okay? So it's a strong uh, basic right. It's very strong, actually. And that is why um, the claims that Cari Francione and Tom Reagan can make are much stronger than the claims that, for example, Peter Singer makes. Looking at animal experiments, even if you can find a cure that saves a lot of people, um, then still it's violating bodily autonomy, and this right, uh, this basic right, is stronger than the right to live of many other sentient beings. Yeah. So that's why um, Tom Reagan and Gary Francione, if they apply the, um, this principle to all sentient beings, you're more extremely abolitionist than ever before. Okay. Now, of course, you can say it, the, the, the middle finger is not infinitely long. So there are extreme, extreme situations like, can we not sacrifice one chimpanzee in order to save the whole population of Belgium? <laughs> Such uh, kind of things. And perhaps we can say like, okay, we could even sacrifice one person in order to save the population of Europe. Yeah, well, I would say, Okay, then, um, the, it's not, this basic right is not infinitely strong. I will not sacrifice uh, all life on Earth <laughs> in order um, not to violate a basic right of only one being. So it's a strong principle, but it's not absolute again. Um, now, there's still another problem. If you look in the wild, um, the predation problem. I spoke about it last year, um, and it's highly, highly, highly underestimated amongst moral philosophers. Highly, um, that's an understatement. Um, we really, I guess, we really need another principle, a ring finger, because if I look at literature, answers that some animal ethicists give in order to, the, the claim is we do not have a duty to save a zebra from a lion. The lion is attacking, and most, people have, uh, have the intuition, well, we do not have a duty to stop the lion and kill the lion if need be um, to save hundreds of zebras. Um, and in order to justify this intuition, it's really to make it consistent. You can only do it, I guess, with adding another um, principle, and this is the ring finger. And this principle, it refers to actually something that also meat eaters kind of value, namely naturalness. But of course, naturalness, I have to really specify and clarify what this notion is. It's not what most meat eaters think it is. 
And this um, notion of naturalness, it's also related to the value of biodiversity. So you can see you can value well-being, you can value justice and whatever, but also you can value naturalness. And this is where environmental ethics comes in, you know, um, speaking about intrinsic rights of ecosystems and so on. Um, I will read a principle for you. So if a behavior violates the forefinger and the middle finger, for example, predation, one um, lion attacking in a lifetime hundreds of zebras, that's really a violation of the forefinger, 100 zebras dead for one line, come on. Uh, the middle finger, 100 zebras used as merely a means for only one line, that's also a... Uh, okay. This behavior, if this behavior violates the forefinger and middle finger principles, then the behavior is still allowed. Um, it does not mean it's obligatory, but it's still allowed. Only if, at the same time, three conditions are met. Um, the behavior should be natural, which means a direct consequence of spontaneous evolution. It should be normal, so it should happen uh, a lot. Uh, in the world, and it should be necessary. So it should be important for the survival of sentient beings. Looking at predation, it happens a lot, it is important for the survival of sentient beings, and it's natural because it's a, a direct consequence of evolution. You know, the, the, instead of with this organ transplantation, the, the surgeon did not uh, spontaneously evolve into sacrificing beings for other uh, in the hospital, but the lion spontaneously evolved into a, uh, a predator, a carnivore. Um, and so you have three conditions. If you're familiar with um, carnism, you can really see the three justifications, the three ends, normal, natural, and necessary. So I use actually a part of the ideology of carnism. I turn it around a little bit, I tweak a little bit, and I use it in the advantage to make an ethical a uh, system of animal equality um, more consistent with our strongest intuitions. Um, our strongest intuitions, I have to say, uh, this is important because it's not only the predation problem, we have also other problems. Imagine that scientists discovered that insects are really sentient beings, really, really sentient beings. Um, now, if you move around by accident, you kill more than one sentient being. Um, from the forefinger principle, you can derive like all the big animals should stop moving because um, it's way too much loss of well-being, okay? Do we really want to say that, that we all and all the big animals should stop moving if we find out that insects are sentient beings? So there's another uh, intuition that says no, big animals are still allowed to move around. Why? Well. Movement is normal, it's natural, uh, we spontaneously evolve to move around, and it's of course natural for survival of um, sentient beings. Um, there are other things like, um, suppose, and in, in real life there will be, um, animal species who uh, have a well-being that does not contribute enough to the four-finger principle. So the frogs or so, they have a small lifetime, um, you know, they... Um, and the contribution of well-being of frogs, uh, it might, uh, for example, uh, lower kind of average well-being on Earth. Um, it might violate the four-finger principle. Does it say that all beings who do not uh, efficiently enough contribute to well-being uh, are not allowed to procreate? No, my intuition says um, even frogs, if. Uh, um, even frogs are still allowed to procreate. So I have at least three totally different situations that violate the forefinger and the middle finger principle. Um, and my intuition, and most of us, I guess, say this kind of behaviors are still allowed. So the only way I can solve it is with adding another finger, the ring finger. Um, and so we can say that just as lifetime well-being is the value of a sentient being, uh, biodiversity is the value of an ecosystem. Um, so bi biodiversity, it's a function of all the variation of life forms and processes that are the direct consequence of natural evolution. And this value of biodiversity is related to, is related to uh, the three N principles. If a behavior is natural, it contributes to biodiversity. If it's natural and normal, it contributes a lot to biodiversity and it's natural, normal, and necessary, it means that if this behavior 
if we would say the rule is this behavior should stop, then a lot of biodiversity will uh, be lost. You know, for example, predation. If we say we have a duty, um, we have a duty to stop the lion. If you say the rule is we have a duty to stop the lion, we apply the rule, uh, the the thumb principle to uh, the ring finger. This rule, stopping the predator, the lion, it should be universalized, which means we should want a world where all predators are prohibited, not allowed anymore to hunt. Yeah, they stop hunting. What happens? All these predators, they die. What happens? A huge loss of uh, biodiversity for the predators, but also for other species that are dependent on the predators. Okay, Way too much loss of biodiversity. Um, so even if biodiversity itself has little value, this huge amount of biodiversity, it's strong enough to say like this behavior of predation is still allowed. So I, I apply here, there's an example of applying the thumb principle to the ring finger to make the system more consistent. Um, what I did is with these uh, fingers, um, the middle finger, for example, I can give 10 dilemmas and you say this behavior is not allowed, ah, even if it's good for the four finger principle. Um, your intuitions say in these 10 different cases it's not allowed, so you introduce another principle, the middle finger, that captures this, all these intuitions in one principle. And the same for the ring finger, there are three different situations, procreation of frogs, predation of lions, and um, movement of big animals, if, then, if insects are sentient. Um, three different situations. And uh, all these intuitions can be captured in one principle. So then I think like, it's like filling in a crossword puzzle. It makes sense that the words, they cross each other and you really get, um, are more convinced of uh, the validity of the, uh, the solution if um, you can find more situations where your intuitions are coherent with each other. And now there is one final uh, principle, the little finger, <laughs> this one, um, and it is related to what I call tolerated partiality and the value of personal relationships. So the little finger, it's little, it means the principle is weak and it can deviate a little bit from the other principles. Yeah? Um, this deviation is what I would call partiality. Um, the question is, this is the Gary Francione again, um, or you all heard about it. Um, um, dilemma, your child or the dog. That's a burning house. Um, the meat eater asks you, um, you can save only one individual, your child or the dog. Ha, ah, you save your child, catch you, your species. Um, now, you can attack this uh, kind of uh, thought experiment in different ways. But in order to solve it, um, you need a little finger. Um, what do I mean with it? Well, let's first read the, the principle. In helping others, so this is a burning house, I help others, I help the child or the dog. In helping others, you are allowed to be a bit partial uh, in favor of your loved ones, your child, or if you love your dog, your dog. Um, as long as you are prepared to tolerate similar levels of partiality of everyone else. So am I, let's look again at the burning house dilemma. Um, your child or a child from Africa. You save your child, um, suppose you're not from Africa. Um, and I can reply to you, hi, you're racist because you value white people over people from Africa. No, it does not mean that you're racist because uh, suppose that the father of this African child was in the house and this father would save the child from Africa. Now what would your reaction be? You can have two kinds of responses. One is, um, you know, uh, my child was white, your child was black, whites have a higher moral status and more rights, so you should have saved my child instead of yours. Um, now that would be racist. Yeah? The other kind of answer that you can give is, you know, I feel sad that my child died, but I understand your choice. I would have saved my child if I were in this situation. I tolerate your choice that you saved the other child, not mine. Uh, if you are prepared to tolerate this choice, that means that you're not necessarily a racist. Um, 
and so in, this is the question you, you you can be you're allowed to be a little bit partial towards your own children um, even if for example a burning house you can save your child or two children from Africa then even then most people would say I would save my child even if it violates the four finger principle because saving two children is better than saving only one um, but here we value personal relationships. If you have a strong connection with your child, uh, a strong emotional bond, you are allowed to save the child even if it violates the four finger principle. So you are allowed to be a little bit partial, okay? But you're not allowed to be uh, too much partial. For example, okay, I save my child in the burning house. Does this mean that if my child needs a new organ, I am allowed to sacrifice an African child? No. If my child needs a cure for a disease, am I allowed to use dogs for experiments? No, um, because that violates the middle finger principle. So you see, um, the middle finger principle comes into play um, to say that's way too partial. If you're going to sacrifice African children, um, use them as merely means, you should not do it. So this solves the, the burning house dilemma. It solves um, if uh, meat eaters have this intuition, like it, it's way too demanding to this speciesism stuff, it's way too demanding. Well, actually it is not. Um, you're allowed to be a bit partial. The only thing that I ask meat eaters is that if I have a strong emotion with a dog, uh, an emotional connection with a dog, and if I save the dog instead of a human child, we should tolerate it. If you're going to say, um, look, uh, children are more important, a higher moral status, uh, more uh, rights to live than uh, a dog, then that will be speciesist. So we should tolerate the choice of people who save dogs instead of um, humans. Actually, we already do it. A lot of us accept that people uh, give a lot of money to, uh, for food for the dog, for um, um, to cure diseases for the dog. You can... Um, so a friend of mine had a cat, uh, the cat needs an operation, costs 400 euros. With 400 euros, you can save four children in Africa. Um, but we would accept that uh, it is allowed to save the cat instead of the four children in Africa. If you have a very strong connection with the cat and not with the children in Africa. It does not mean that you're allowed to sacrifice children in Africa as merely means to save your cat. That's no. Okay. Um, now I've summarized five principles. This also means each principle stands for a different kind of uh, equality. The um, thumb principle, it uh, values impartiality. Um, the forefinger means that um, well-being of everyone is equally important. Um, the middle finger means that all sentient beings have an equal claim to this um, basic right not to be used as merely a means. Um, so this is kind of Cary Francione kind of equality. Uh, the ring finger principle means that everyone, all living beings, have an equal claim to a behavior that is both natural, normal, and necessary, a behavior that contributes to biodiversity. Like you can say, the, the, the lion can say to the zebra, look, if I am not allowed to eat, then neither are you. If I'm not allowed to eat and I need zebras to eat, then neither is the uh, zebra allowed to eat, and it doesn't matter if it's zebras or if it's grass. Um, the principle says it's behavior that's normal, natural, and necessary, so this behavior, we should fairly distribute it. And then there is the little finger. Uh, this also gives a fifth different kind of equality. Um, in looking at the, the burning house again, um, my child and a child from Africa, they inherit a kind of equality, what I call tolerated choice equality. Um, I tolerate your choice to save the child from Africa. Um, so my child and the child from Africa, they have a kind of tolerated choice equality. And that's different from the other equality principles. So if I speak about ethical consistency of animal equality, this animal equality part, it consists of five different principles, and that's important to stress. That, um, there's not only one equality thing, there are five different equality principles. Have I on one minute left to apply it to animal rights? Let's apply the five fingers to animal rights. Um, 
Four finger means um, balancing well-being, so you can be a cow, a dairy cow, or you can be a human being. Um, if a human being is not allowed anymore to drink uh, um, cow's milk, uh, but instead has to use uh, the, the vegan alternatives, it's a, little, it's a really small uh, decrease of well-being. It's a small decrease of liberty. Um, on the other hand, this cow, um, the cow, the suffering of the dairy cow, that's a really big loss of well-being. So the, the dairy cow is in the worst of position, increase of well-being of the dairy cow, which means sacrificing this little bit of liberty of, um, of us to drink cow's milk. Uh, we should not use dairy cows as merely means. So what we do with dairy cows, we need their body, because without their body we cannot have their milk. Um, and the cow has to do or undergo something, being pregnant and so on and so on, that the cow does not want at the moment. Yeah? So we violate the middle finger principle. We use the cow as merely a means. The cow is a sentient being, and then again, uh, its bodily autonomy is not respected. Um, now you can, s um, applying the ring finger now, um, if um, an animal, like, uh, let's imagine that meat for us was really necessary, we will die if we do not eat meat, then things will change. For, then you can say it's still allowed to eat meat, um, but uh, the, uh, the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics say, okay, vegan diet is perfectly healthy for uh, all human beings, so we cannot apply, we cannot um, use the ring finger in order to justify consuming animal products, yeah? Um, because it's not necessary for us, animal products. The little finger, um, can we introduce the little finger in order to justify our use of animals? Okay, we are allowed to be partial to some degree, but um, we will never um, tolerate uh, the partiality that we have towards humans instead of livestock animals. Um, so um, it's way too partial, um, this kind of factory farming stuff. Um, and we cannot uh, justify our consumption of animal products using the um, little finger. So what we are left is, the, these two fingers say, animal consumption of animal products is strongly not allowed. And these two fingers, they, uh, the little finger and um, the ring finger, they say you cannot justify it by other means. So then using the rule of thumb, we apply it to the fingers and we say, okay, the rule is stop consuming animal products. That is what everyone should do, okay then. And then finally, um, if that is what everyone should do, then I should do it. Even if no one else does it, then still I have to do it. So that's... Again, uh, pressing the thumb, um, I have to be vegan myself. Um, so this is again a summary of the five principles. There are a lot of interrelations between these principles. Um, you can, the, the little finger is related to the middle finger in some kind of um, complex way, but I cannot discuss it here. Um, so there are a lot of um, connections between these fingers. So I think that together, these fingers can m make a really strong, consistent ethical system that best fits not only my intuitions, but also the strongest moral intuitions of meat eaters. That's my claim. I look at the strongest moral intuitions of meat eaters, and I figure out, solving the crossword puzzle, figure out what kind of principles we can derive that best fit with them, and I think this will be the end result. It might be that you, um, like Peter Singer, uh, has no much interest in uh, the middle finger, for example, and has a problem with the ring finger and so on. Um, but for most of us, um, all those fingers are relevant to some degree. And to what degree they are relevant? Well, I would say um, that's for democracy and so on to decide and, and to discuss with each other how strongly you value well-being of the worst stuff, how much priority should we give to the worst stuff. That's also a matter of degree, but we can uh, try to find a solution in a democratic way with that. That will be the end of my presentation. Any questions or comments? No. This was me. 
mehr auf Englisch heißt. Okay. Um, I'm not sure the correct uh, word in uh, or prince, prince, uh, okay. In English, um, in German, it's Prinzip der Nähe, uh, principle of nearance or proximity. maybe proximity. Okay, uh, it's a small finger, and he, uh, I'm not sure. Um, how do you understand it? First, you said there is a personal relationship, and uh, there is. Um, also, um, those uh, uh, that I love, so I have really this connection. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on, on the other side, you said um, it's um, uh, it's enough to have um, a preference, I think, to help someone or to um, recognize someone, and um, and I'm not sure if there is. Um, um, if it harms uh, the first um, principle, the principle of university, uh, uh, universalism, um, when you um, don't uh, take it to, um, uh, when it's uh, not only uh, the relationship, the personal and the loved ones, mm -hmm. but um, uh, those that I prefer and those that I, uh, yeah. because, um, yeah. I, I think it's, it doesn't go together then. Yeah, I understand the question. It's a good question. Um, there are different things to say. Um, so this little finger, um, it's um, in the family statics of care. They like this uh, kind of personal relationship thing. Uh, for me, it does not necessarily mean that the relationship should be mutual. If you have a preference simply for dogs, even if it's not your own dog and you have never seen a dog, okay, you can still say the dog. Um, now, you should indeed apply the thumb also to the little finger. And that is, if you look at the principle, that is actually been done. Um, you are allowed to be partially in favor of your loved ones as long as, here it comes, you prepare, uh, you are prepared to tolerate similar levels of partiality of everyone else. And that is where the universality comes into play. Um, so if I can be partial to my, towards my loved ones, then you're allowed to be partial towards your loved ones. If I cannot re really not accept it, then I'm not allowed to be partial towards my loved ones. I can save my child, and I will tolerate your right to save your child. And every, for everyone, everyone can be partial to this degree that I will be partial, not higher. Um, I cannot sacrifice you in order to save me if I need an organ, because um, we cannot apply this universally. I would not turn it around and say, you're allowed to sacrifice me. Mm -hmm. So is this clear that um, every, if I can be partial to some degree, then I have to say that everyone is allowed to be partial to the same degree in all similar situations. It's a little bit uh, provocative um, what I say right now, but uh, the Nazis that live today in Germany, they don't say that um, the Germans are the best. They say um, we are socialists for Germans, and also the French people should be socialists for the French people and uh, every country, every nation, or every volk? every people. They say um, should um, um, just look at themselves and be proud and um, defend themselves. And so it's also a print. This is also a, a nearance and a preference for the own nation on or. Um, and uh, I think um, I have myself, I'm the nearest to myself, and then there is my family, perhaps my daughter if I have one, or my brother, and then uh, it's my neighbor, my friends, um, and then it's uh, um, the people in my town, and then in my land, and uh, in Europe then, and uh, Africa is far away then. They have also a different culture, so um, if there's, uh, to tolerate my preference for those who are near to me uh, or close to me, yeah. then um, I, I could be a racist also um, or a speciesist. Well, that's the point where we have to dig deeper into the real motivations. We can all understand our preference for our own children, but our preferences for um, people from our own nation 
Um, well, we can say this is a cultural construction and so on. And there it becomes tricky because if it's a cultural construction and you do not, you avoid kind of arbitrariness and so on. Uh, then I think, I really think that um, if you really ask deeper questions to this racist, he will come to a point where he cannot, he will move into a contradiction. Um, it's too short now to explain what might happen, how he can try to justify his, um, of course he can say like, look, I'm really indoctrinated um, to be racist towards my own nation. I can't help it. I, I, I'm willing to follow therapy, but even then I'm, I'm not able to, um, okay, in that kind of situation I can say like, okay, if, you're, if your brains cannot change that way, like, um, most of us would say, like, I really can't be really impartial towards all children. I really value my own children. You can do a lot of therapy with me, but I will value my own children. And we all understand this, like, yeah, that's right. We, I will not be able to overcome this preference for my own child. But overcoming preference for your own nation, that's much easier. And the opponent, the racist, has to say like, actually it is. I was told like that way, but I can extend my, uh, I can easily extend my um, moral circle. Because for example, um, I live in Belgium, you can say you're a Belgian nationalist, but I cannot really tell a difference between a Belgian person on the street and a German person on the street. They, if I simply approach them, I do not know. Um, if I see my child, I can tell a difference between my child and another child. That's, I know, I automatically I already know it. So there are different ways to, to see like, um, if the racist really tries to justify nationalism using the little finger, it will become really hard if you press on and say like, look, I still can't understand that you're so indoctrinated and, and so on. Um, so I guess that's where, um, well, if, to acknowledge that um, it's too partial to select the own nation as a real criteria for saving children. Um, like this is in Burning House, this is a Belgian child and this is a German child. Ah, it's a Belgian, okay, I saved this one. I don't think it will happen that way. Hi, first thank you for the presentation. Um, actually, my question is quite specific and it is about the ring finger which says about uh, naturalness and the value of biodiversity. Uh, well, in, in natural conservation, we have like two major pathways of how to deal with habitats that are constructed by humans. So like the most common example is meadows. Those are habitats that, are, that cannot exist if we, we don't uh, put our energy in them. And there's like lots of biodiversity on them. Like otherwise, there would be like main woodlands through all of the Europe. So if we wouldn't put our energy into them, like all the species who live there would be extinct. So that's kind of a really biodiversity problem. But at the same time, it talks about naturalness, and there is, well, this spontaneous evolution wasn't really spontaneous but still it is necessary to, to put our energy in because it's necessary for the living beings there to, to, to remain there, to, to live there. So how would you argue that? Yeah, um, again, that's a long answer. And yeah, this is a short summary of my PhD. This is a topic that I deal with in my research uh, really extensively. Um, you can make it more extreme. Uh, what if we enhance biodiversity by genetic modifying plants and introduce them in the wild? Like, oh, you want variation of species? Ah, and make another species and oh, throw it in the wild. <laughs> um, but that is why I added a direct consequence of evolution. Um, and so the more um, there is an external conscious interference, that there is an, a moral agent like we, we are moral agents. If a moral agent interferes in the process of biodiversity, introducing new genes, in the, um, changing habitats with uh, um, exotic species, uh, introducing species from South Africa here, the more you do it, uh, the less these 
trees and so on counts as biodiversity in this environment. So most of the environmentalists says then the intuition, the more artificial it becomes, the less um, value of biodiversity it has. Yeah, you can make thousands of genetically modified uh, plants and, put, and release them in the wild and increase biodiversity in that way. But most ecologists, um, philosophers, they would say like, no, that's not a way to save biodiversity because that's not even biodiversity. Um, so I don't know if that comes close to an answer. Um, but yeah, that's, um, I'll try to be brief now. Sorry, we are out of time, but I guess you will be around for people to ask you further questions. Thank you very much.